So switching to a few more topics before we move on. Um, so the FDA approved now palbociclib with just about every, I guess, hormonal agent, is that correct, every AI? Um, does that have any clinical meaning or benefit to us, Debu? Well, I think it gives us more flexibility. Every now and then we have patients that may tolerate one AI better than another. Obviously, they have a lot of overlapping toxicities, but I think it makes it easier. Some health plans may make it harder for one AI versus <coughs> another. So I think it makes things simpler. Uh, when the Mona Lisa 7 data comes out, we will actually have some data with tamoxifen since that is allowed on the Mona Lisa 7, which is dedicated to premenopausal patients who all get gonadotropin analog. So uh, they do get ovarian suppression, but if they have not seen uh, either endocrine agent, they could elect to take tamoxifen. That's physician's choice in Mona Lisa mm -hmm. 7, yes. correct? Yeah. All right, well, that'll be very interesting to see. I mean, because it just, again, as I said before at the beginning, and I think we all probably agree, it doesn't matter what scenario you have. It doesn't matter what endocrine agent you have. It appears that you just take that and it has a hazard ratio of 0.5, you double it. That seems to be what seems to rule of thumb. We'll see if that uh, tends up to happen. So the next question now is, so assuming all these patients are going on these agents, you put someone on, say, ribociclib and letrozole. It's now two years later and they progress. What do you do? Kim, what do you do? Um, well, I'm, I put them on a clinical trial, Adam. No, if there's not a clinical... If you can't get a clinical yeah, trial. Yeah, because there's, as, as Carlos mentioned, there's <coughs> lots of trials that will help us understand should we continue, should we not? I think that's one of the big unanswered questions here. Is, is it a similar phenomena like we believe HER2 disease to be, which yeah. is you're taking your foot off the brake by stopping the CDK inhibitor, and that we don't know. So um, in the absence of a clinical trial, I'll use single agent fulvestrin after AI CDK inhibitor. Carlos, yeah. Um, well, before choosing a therapy, I think that we probably should rebiopsy that patient. Okay. And in all possibility, reinterrogate that tumor. Think about it. For? for uh, well, for, for a number of somatic alterations that may be associated with resistance or not. Uh, so think about it. These tumors have never been subjected to this Darwinian block in the history of the planet. And we know they're going to progress. Right. And they have to figure, it's, it, and they won't do it by magic. They have to develop something. And so I think we have probably an obligation as physicians to at least make an attempt to reinterrogate that disease, which is probably going to look a little different than the diagnostic biopsy and the primary metastatic biopsy. And I agree with Kim after that. I think fulvestrin is a good choice. Fulvestrin everolimus would also be a good choice. Right. Uh, or a clinical trial informed by whatever alteration we find or in that biopsy. No, I agree. I mean, I was, you know, again, our lung colleagues have great you know, they have genomically driven therapy. Could this be the first instance where potentially we as medical oncologists who do breast cancer do genomically driven therapy for a particular ESR1? As a, you know, 30% of the patients likely will have an ESR1 mutation on long-term AIs, right? Yeah. Yeah. So should this be, you know, you're talking about interrogate the tumor. I mean, should we just interrogate the plasma DNA? Both. Or a sequence? Both. Well, so, sometimes you may only be able to do plasma, but at this point we cannot equate plasma with a tumor, tumor. biopsy either. So I think that's something that we should clearly do. So um, easy one mutations, uh, we have now a data set of over 2,000 patients that we have biopsied at, at progression. At progression. Just, uh, thyroid disease. So a patient that have an ESR1 mutation, um, the progression-free survival to any AI is three months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And if they don't, it's 14 months. So today... This is at progression. <coughs> at progression. So today, I mean, I think that <coughs> this is the kind of information that you need in order to make decisions. And I still see, and we all still see, if sometimes patients being re-exposed to an AI. Wow. Uh, right. Well, if they have a mutation of the ER gene, they're not going to respond. So I think that that's something that we need to take into account. Um, Carlos is right. We have ER mutations. We have transcriptional factor mutations that also influence endocrine resistance. We'll talk about that this later, but we have PI3 kinase alpha mutations that also play a role. We have something very interesting, which is our RB2 mutations. Yes, I was about to talk about that. Okay, and we have therapies for that. We yeah. have clinical trials going right. on, very exciting, with neuratinib and others. Correct. So I, I think this is 
important and it ought to be brought into clinical practice. The question is, can we convince insurers to pay for these tests? A foundation or whatever is garden is three thousand well, dollars. Well, um, we're a few. We're not like Memorial where they can do it for free from, on everybody, or as part of your. Uh, we don't. Part I, of your I, don't I don't think right. we're ready to be applying it universally no. right now. Certainly, we are all using it for assignment to clinical trials. I totally agree with what you've said about the natural history of these patients. Uh, but we have to get some numbers. In, in other words, so you have an ESR1 mutation. What 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 do you do? Well, he uh, has he has data from. Well, water. no, no, I understand that. Right. The, so the, we know that AIs are not as effective. But we haven't done controlled studies to see. Uh, should we move them over to full vestrant? We're doing one too, a blood biopsy based uh, a triage study where uh, uh, ESR mutations may steer you towards uh, a SERD uh, uh, or, uh, versus not. Um, I think it's coming very soon, but we have to do our homework. Uh, and these right, it's not standard going. of care by any means. Yeah, I'd I mean, like to offer a word of caution, which right. is strange coming from me, because no, first not. of all, I'm You're all about cautioned. sequential biopsies and you know profiling and understanding what's driving that tumor sure. at the time of progression. But we have to be a little careful, and that I've seen patients who've done this, have done the guardian, have done a biopsy, got a foundation medicine after patients have progressed and they see an ESR mutation and then they switch the patient to chemo. And I don't think that that is oh, the no. right thing to do. That's I, not, yeah, and I don't no. think anyone's suggesting Oh, an ESR mutation switch to chemo, no, I wouldn't do that. Correct, yeah. but I'm just saying that it's not like a mutation that we typically think of as you will not respond to endocrine therapy. So if you are gonna be using these genomic assays, you have to be very cautious about how you're gonna use them and the implications are yeah. really at a research level at this point. They're informative, but I don't think they should drive major treatment decisions. I think today, with the data that we have, and there are maybe five or six good papers published already, I agree with you that with multiple genes, you need to be very careful. But in the case of uh, ESR1 mutations, we have data that fulvestrin uh, in these patients works better. Yeah, I know. Than, right. And I think that, at this point, that particular gene um, it's enough information, at least for me, to detect practice. I, I look at this data. Uh, I agree with you that there are many other mutations that we don't have enough data, but that particular one, the data looks pretty solid to me. Yeah, and I think clinically, though, in the patient you just yeah. described, they've progressed on an AI, yeah. and After we know years. that the, the, the benefits of fulvestrant are, are kind of as good if there's an ESR mutation. And so I would switch that patient to that. What I'm saying is I think people are, are, there's so much data, and for the practicing oncologists, they see ESR mutation, and I just want to make certain we're being very precise about this, which is it doesn't mean that they won't respond. It just um, means that if they have the mutation, fulvestrin might be a more preferred agent. It doesn't mean switch them to chemotherapy, I think is. Maybe, maybe I agree with what you're saying, but there are two aspects of this. One is the decision for the patient. Um, the also is the fact that uh, this disease we're creating, right? ER mutations is a disease we created with uh, under aromatase inhibitors, with estrogen deprivation. The point is we're gonna be creating new diseases and we're gonna to have to just write that book. I mean, and if we don't profile that disease. Now, that patient with the ER mutation, you know, may well respond to capecitabine. And I'm happy with that, right. but at least I know <laughs> that that mutation well, occurred you, in that trial, setting. The Pearl trial, which is a toughie, the Pearl <laughs> trial design is people who have progressed on an AI get, I think, exemestane and palbo versus cape. And they don't do, they're, I don't think they're stratifying, I and mean, they may or may not be stratifying for ER mutations, but 30% of the patients in that trial may not respond to the exemestane because of the very reason. And the other thing is that CDK4 inhibitors are not the solution to ER mutations either. Right. Stevi Osterich from our institution just published that 20% of those patients post-CDK4 inhibitor will have ER mutations.